to, to Grand Rounds on time, so thanks. Um, today, we are absolutely delighted and pleased to have Dr. Steven Lubitz join us. Um, someone um, well known to me, O'Yuri, and Dan Jacoby for quite some time. Um, uh, as a quick reminder, um, in terms of questions, please feel free to type questions into the chat function or uh, use the raise hand function at the conclusion of the talk. Um, so uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining. And I will now uh, hand things over to Dan Jacoby for the introduction. Hi, thanks, Dan, and thanks a lot, Steve. Um, this is uh, the third um, cardiovascular genetics uh, team sort of sponsored Grand Rounds, um, which we're really excited about. Um, and I'm uh, representing cardiovascular genetics group in introduction for uh, Steve. Um, Dr. Lubitz is a friend of mine, it's going way back to residency. Uh, we work together at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, and uh, it was a really great environment, um, as Steve uh, was just recalling before, before we started the, the talk this morning. Um, after that, uh, uh, he went up to Boston to um, Brigham and Women's and Mass General for uh, both uh, uh, postdoctoral research fellowships um, and ultimately as a fellowship in, in cardiac electrophysiology. Um, he's currently an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and has numerous um, awards and honors over the years, currently supported by um, R01 grant funding after completing his K23, with a specific interest in uh, genetics, specifically atrial fibrillation. Although if you review through the myriad papers th that he's published, he has a hand in multiple different aspects of cardiovascular genetics from atherosclerotic disease to lipid management to uh, cardiomyopathy to arrhythmia. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Lubitz to um, Yale Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Uh, looking forward to your talk today, Steve. Thanks very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today, virtually, and to see you all. I'm excited to uh, uh, present today. Let me um, just get the screen up here. Do you see the full screen or the presenter mode? We see it uh, perfectly. Okay, great. Excellent. So um, uh, pleasure to be here today and, and to see some good friends uh, on this call. We hosted Dan uh, a couple of months ago um, and Dan gave a terrific talk at uh, Mass General Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. So I'm excited to, uh, uh, to be with you today. There's about a 99% chance one of my children or a dog will walk in during this talk. I hope you don't mind. Here are my disclosures um, on the left are some of the disclosures Dan mentioned. There's also some work in AFib screening that I'll talk a little bit about today. Not a lot, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, today. The focus will largely be on uh, genetics. As Dan mentioned, I wear a number of hats, uh, clinical electrophysiology, uh, arrhythmia genetics, and clinical and translational research. I know I think everybody on this call is doing many, many things at the same time. Um, this just happens to be the menu of things that I'm involved in uh, for the most part. And my research objectives are largely divided into three buckets. One is understanding the mechanisms of cardiovascular disease. And to do that, we really leverage human genetics uh, to give us insights into biological pathways uh, that relate to cardiovascular disease, mostly focused on arrhythmias, but as Dan mentioned, uh, additional entities related to uh, arrhythmias and cardiovascular disease. Assessing risk, and this can uh, range from anything, uh, including conventional epidemiologic or biostatistical methods for assessing risk of disease and morbidity from disease, all the way through to really exciting work that we're doing now with machine learning and deep learning using EHR data, as well as other large biobank data. I won't really get into that today, but that's an exciting area. And then improving outcomes, we're really focusing on pragmatic interventions, um, several of the which are focused on screening for atrial fibrillation. I'll talk very uh, briefly about some of that today. Um, so I'm going to present a vignette from each of these uh, uh, different buckets, mostly focusing on the genetics today. <clears throat> so just to make sure everybody's on the same page, you probably all uh, are quite familiar with this, uh, given where you are at Yale and how sophisticated things are in, in your program there, but a brief guide to genomics. I think I'll just run through this. 
If we start at the bottom of the, of the screen here, we have cells within the nuclei of cells or chromosomes. That's where all the DNA are. Um, and then if you sort of unwind the, the chromosomes, make yourself all the way up to the top of the screen here, you see that there are these units on the chromosomes, which we, we call genes. And the genes are comprised of exons and introns and then regulatory regions even outside of the gene proper. Um, and if we uh, zero in a little bit further, we start to see these nucleotide uh, uh, bonds that, uh, that we call base pairs. And when we think about genetic variation, there's usually an alteration of either a single base pair or a chunk of DNA that we're, we tend to refer to. And we know that those alterations can result in phenotypic variation and sometimes disease. And um, uh, just taking this a little bit further, when we sort of unwind the DNA and the DNA is uh, transcribed into RNA, and we hear a lot about this, um, uh, that process is called transcription. Um, and when we go from transcription to protein, uh, is a process called translation where that RNA can leave the cell nucleus and encounter the machinery of the cell that actually reads the RNA as an instruction manual, pulls together amino acids, binds the amino acids together, generates a protein. And hopefully, if everything goes to plan, that's a functional protein that does what it's supposed to do. And now you can understand if there's a problem anywhere along the way with one of those base pairs or a chunk of DNA, either transcription can go awry or even translation can be problematic. When we think about genetic variation in cardiovascular disease, in the clinical arena, we're typically thinking about very rare genetic variation. That's usually what we think about when we think about ordering a genetic test. So in this pie chart on the left-hand side, if you think about that entire circle as the entire genome, uh, most of it is comprised of what we call the non-coding genome, even though that may not be quite accurate. When we think about genes that make proteins or the exome, that comprises only about 1% of the entire genome. And then even among the exome, when we do genetic testing in the clinic, we're talking about only a sliver of the entire exome. Most of the genes that exist in the body, we don't even bother looking at when we do a genetic test in the clinic, say for long QT syndrome or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because we have no idea how to interpret that information. In the research sphere, we're getting some clues as to how to use that information, but clinically, we really have a hard time figuring out what we're supposed to do with that information. So we really focus on a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of the genome when we do genetic testing in the clinic. And we're really focused on variation that has a profound impact on that process that I just described before and results in an alteration of the protein that's clearly observable and, and we can make inferences about just by looking at the DNA sequence. Um, but this paradigm of common versus rare genetic variation and effect size has been observed and remarked on for, for decades now. Uh, and if you look at this, this sort of summarizes the, the concept, allele frequency is sort of the, the, just the frequency in the population of a genetic variant on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the effect size. So how profound is that genetic variant? How big of an effect does it have on uh, phenotype, something that we can observe? And if you uh, move from rare, uh, which is where we typically think about things in the clinic when we have a family or somebody, as I mentioned before, with some of these uh, inherited cardiovascular diseases that we typically encounter in the clinic with very large effects. You'll see this run in a family, for example, uh, or this condition run in a family. We sometimes will refer to these conditions as monogenic or Mendelian conditions. Classically, these genetic variants are referred to as mutations. If we move along the right-hand side of that x-axis there to polymorphisms, these are common genetic variants that exist in all of us. And when added together, these tiny effects may contribute a large effect. They may comprise a very large effect on a phenotype. Um, but it takes hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of these genetic variants to have that desired effect or that uh, observable effect, not desired necessarily. Um, and just a little bit more on the background, so we're all on the same page here, uh, a genome-wide association study. You've probably heard of these. You may not read about these every day, but surely over the last decade or two, you've heard about these because we're living through what is really a revolution in human biology right now. 
aided by advances in technology for genome assessment. And some of the most incredible work that has happened has happened with a relatively simple experiment called a genome-wide association study. And you can think of it in its simplest form as a case control study. That's not how these are always done. Uh, but just for example, you can think about a, a sample of individuals with a disease and a sample of individuals without a disease from which DNA is isolated. And then DNA is run over this little chip that may contain anywhere from 500,000 to 5 million chemical probes that are assessing for known polymorphisms, these common genetic variants. We know where they live. We know that we expect them with some degree of frequency in the population. We know that they differ according to ancestry. And these probes just assess for the presence or absence of those particular genetic variants in a given individual. And then what you can do is at each of those SNP positions, test whether that SNP is more common in, or one flavor of that SNP is more common among people with disease as compared to people without disease. Sorry, my dog was knocking. Uh, and then in this example, you can see SNP1 is relatively uh, equivalent between those with and without a disease. You can see those green dots look about the same. Uh, SNP2, again, it's about the same in those with and without disease. SNP3 seems to be more common among those with disease than without disease. And if we repeat this t-test or chi-squared test or whatever kind of test, depending on the experiment we're doing, we'll see a different uh, strength of association. And we can plot that. I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like. So I'm going to lead with atrial fibrillation. Here I'll talk about a few other conditions. But uh, I'm going to take you through atrial fibrillation as an example disease uh, through which we can apply these genetic principles to learn about the biological mechanisms and potentially even risk uh, using these techniques. So we know that if you have a first degree relative, these are data from the Framingham Heart Study, and if you have a first degree relative with atrial fibrillation, you have a roughly 40% increased risk of developing atrial fibrillation over a period of eight years or so. If that individual had a fib before the age of 65 in your family, your risk is increased about twofold. And we know that this is independent of many conventional clinical risk factors that we think of for atrial fibrillation. If we do that genome-wide association study and we plot the results, this is typically what we'll look at, something called a Manhattan plot, because we hope to see these skyscrapers on the plot. And in the case of atrial fibrillation, we have enough samples now that we can actually see many, many skyscrapers. In fact, over 100 skyscrapers, and that number is growing. Uh, which indicates that atrial fibrillation is a very complicated disease. And the x-axis is the, the number of uh, the chromosome and the position of a particular variant in the genome. On the y-axis is the negative log 10 of the p-value. So you can think of it as just the significance of association. The higher up on the plot something is, the more significantly associated it is. And on this screen are 10 million dots, each of which represent a single nucleotide polymorphism, a SNP, associate or tested for association with AFib. Anything that rises above that dotted line, which is a multiple testing correction factor, is considered significantly associated with AFib. And we can zero in on these uh, skyscrapers to try to figure out what genes live nearby in that neighborhood to give us a window into what potentially the biological mechanisms of disease are. And what we're learning from common genetic variant analyses using SNPs is that there are a lot of developmental factors that are involved in atrial fibrillation susceptibility. Of course, ion channels are implicated as well. We've always thought of atrial fibrillation as an electrical disease, but interestingly, we're seeing a lot of cardiomyocyte genes as well, suggesting that there might be a myopathic signal underlying atrial fibrillation. We'll come back to that. So what can we learn from a GWAS? Well, we can zero in, as I said, on these peaks, these skyscrapers. And if you look in the left, this is the principal signal for atrial fibrillation. This is a a uh, locus called chromosome four, uh, on chromosome four, uh, Q25. And you can see here, those little dots are basically the genetic variants that we tested for association. They live upstream of a gene called PIDX2. And it turns out PIDX2 wasn't really on the radar for atrial fibrillation susceptibility before the era of genome-wide association studies. But it makes perfect sense now that we've found it. And the direct links between these variants and PIDX2 are not clear, but what we do know about PIDX2 is that it's an important gene for determining right-left symmetry. Uh, 
in the body and particularly in the heart. It suppresses the default formation of a sinus node on the left side of the heart. It specifies the, the smooth muscle cells that form in the pulmonary veins, which we know are important triggers for atrial fibrillation electrically. That's in fact what we do when we do procedures such as catheter ablation for AFib, try to wall off those electrical triggers from coming from the pulmonary veins. So we can start to learn about biology. And then if we take those genes that are closest to that top signal, we group them, you can see on the right-hand side, there are a number of different genes uh, that fit into certain categories. And there's some overlap between these genes, obviously, and a lot of functional characterization that's necessary. But we start to get a clearer picture of what the susceptible signals are for, uh, for a given disease. And this can be applied to any disease in any trait. And in fact, that's exactly what's been going on for the last 10 or 15 years. So can we learn anything about risk from these genetic signals? I'll talk a little bit about polygenic risk scores, which you probably have heard a little bit about. There's a lot of hype and, and hope for, uh, I should say hope and potentially hype for polygenic risk scores. And there probably will be a role for polygenic risk scores in the clinical arena, but we're still trying to figure out what it is. But first, I'll just explain how this works. So you can see that there are different people represented by each row on this slide. And the circle with a V represents, for example, a susceptibility variant. So in the case of AFib, you can think of each of these Vs representing a risk marker for atrial fibrillation. So person one, that top row has three Vs. Person two has two Vs. Person uh, five has four Vs. And when you add up all these Vs in the population and maybe you apply a weighting factor to all of these and you add them up, you end up getting a distribution of genetic susceptibility. And what we have observed is that people at the highest tail of that genetic susceptibility are at high risk for getting a disease. People in the lower tail tend to be at low risk relative to the average person in the population. Uh, and the Vs tend to follow a normal distribution. So polygenic risk, the way it's calculated most conventionally, tends to follow a normal distribution in the population. Um, and this can represent or be represented by a single factor, a single number for each individual, which makes it a very convenient metric. In the old days, we might create a polygenic risk score using only a few variants. And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen is a three SNP polygenic risk score. This is one of the earlier polygenic risk scores for atrial fibrillation. And you can see that individuals in the highest uh, uh, tail of polygenic risk had a markedly increased risk of atrial fibrillation relative to those in the middle or in the lower tail of atrial fibrillation susceptibility. Uh, these days, we're using larger polygenic risk scores. And you can see on the right-hand side, a polygenic risk score comprising 6 million or over 6 million single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we can start to identify, most importantly, these extreme outliers of polygenic risk who are at market, markedly elevated risk for developing a disease, or in this case, a prevalence, prevalence of disease. And we've also seen that clinical and genetic risk factors seem to be complementary. Um, this is an example from the Framingham Heart Study in which polygenic risk was calculated, clinical risk of atrial fibrillation was also calculated, and each was divided up into tertiles. So we had this uh, three by three grid of clinical and polygenic risk, and we just plotted the lifetime risk of developing atrial fibrillation. And you can observe here as you go from left to right, uh, increasing polygenic risk or inherited susceptibility to atrial fibrillation. You can see overall a gradual increase in the lifetime risk of atrial fibrillation. When you stratify by clinical risk factors, similarly, there's an increased risk, which we've known for decades, of atrial fibrillation. And what's particularly interesting is that even among those, so there's a market gradient here, first of all, but even among those, if you look on the right-hand side of the screen, in those with the lower lowest clinical risk, you can see those with high polygenic risk, but a low clinical risk susceptibility to atrial fibrillation still have a lifetime risk of developing atrial fibrillation after the age of 55 of about 40% indicating that polygenic risk probably has a, a pretty important role in determining susceptibility to atrial fibrillation, even when we don't think of somebody as necessarily being at high risk for developing disease. And so there's been, as I mentioned, an explosion of common variant association tests, genome-wide association studies, 
Um, these are data that were last pulled from a GWAS browser uh, in September 2020. You can see all these publications and these just gargantuan number of associations. I mean, it's really remarkable what's happened over time. And you can see here from the beginning of the genome-wide association study era, what started to happen. You can see the 23 chromosomes displayed on the screen and each little circle is another genetic association uh, that's been identified. So we're really unraveling the uh, human biology here just through genetic interrogation. It's a really exciting time, um, but there's so much work to do to make sense of these association signals that we're seeing. And similarly, as expected, there has been an explosion <laughs> as well in the curation and creation of polygenic risk scores. So here's a catalog that was just launched within the last year. And they're trying to archive all of the polygenic risk scores that are being created for traits and have been published. But I'll just tell you, in the life of any computational biology postdoc, they may make 10 or 15 polygenic risk scores in a given day as they're doing experiments for a single paper. So this is clearly an underestimate of what's actually going on out there. What we don't understand is how necessarily to use these polygenic risk scores and whether they'll have a clinical impact. And so I'm going to shift just a little bit from the common variants to the um, rare variant story, which has also been very exciting in, in the recent years and is going to be even more exciting in the, in the next few years as these large biobanks start to get sequenced. And I'll stick with AFib and I'll tell you an example of uh, an experiment that we uh, conducted in which we um, used whole genome sequence data from the NHLBI's Transomics for Precision Medicine whole genome sequencing program, so this is top med. Uh, is what it's referred to. And you can see here that uh, with uh, starting with about 18,000 individuals in phase one of the project, the project's now on phase nine. Uh, after QC, we created a, a case control sample comprising about 7,000 or 8,000 individuals, about 2,500 of whom had early onset AFib that developed before the age of 65. And when we examined the sequence data, we observed a gene uh, that's a household name in cardiovascular medicine, particularly for cardiomyopathy, that was associated with atrial fibrillation. So you can see in the, this gene here is called Titan, and you can see in the top row, each of those black hash marks represents a loss of function variant. So a variant in which we can just look at the DNA and know that the DNA sequence indicates that this variant will uh, cause a deleterious uh, function of that particular uh, protein product. Um, and you can see that those black dash marks are much more common among individuals with early onset atrial fibrillation as compared to those uh, in the control group here. So this was really not a huge surprise in some ways, but at the same time, it was a bit of a paradigm shift or represented a continuation of this paradigm shift for atrial fibrillation in which we're thinking about it as not only an electrical disease, but also a myopathic disease. And increasingly that's the case. And I think the way we're thinking about AFib. And on the clinical front, you can see that if we think about penetrance, so the probability of a phenotype given a particular genotype uh, represented here, what's the likelihood of having atrial fibrillation if you carry one of these Titan truncating variants? You can see that the probability is pretty high uh, for, uh, for AFib that is, it's about 14 or 15% or so. As compared to what we usually think about, which is heart failure and cardiomyopathy, these are data from the UK Biobank now, so a different sample. Um, and you can see that the penetrance is a little bit lower for heart failure and cardiomyopathy as it is for atrial fibrillation. Uh, we also saw that if you go from sort of left to right on this plot, you can see the controls in the first column and then uh, individuals with AFib at different ages of onset uh, in the, the uh, uh, going from sort of the oldest to the youngest, left to right here, you can see that there's a market enrichment for Titan truncating loss of function variants among those with particularly early onset forms of atrial fibrillation. And so I'll, I'll shift away from atrial fibrillation just for a little bit here and just mention that this, these paradigms apply generally to other diseases as well in cardiovascular uh, medicine as well as arrhythmias. So this is a summary cartoon um, highlighting the different monogenic forms of inherited arrhythmia syndromes that we tend to think about, long QT, short QT, catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, Brugada syndrome, et cetera. And you can see that there are different channels uh, that, are, that are typically implicated in these arrhythmia syndromes. 
Yet at the same time, when we do genetic testing in the clinic, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the diagnostic yield varies widely. So for long QT syndrome, about 80% of the time, we can identify a genetic variant that underlies the condition if we have a high probability or a high index of suspicion that we have the diagnosis right for long QT syndrome. And as we move to the right, you can see that we're really not great at understanding what's going on with Brugada syndrome. Only about 20% of the time or more do we find a genetic variant that underlies the condition. So something is missing here, and we, we don't understand the complete picture in terms of genetics or the genetic susceptibility. And I'll tell you just a little bit about Brugada syndrome and then long QT syndrome. So Brugada syndrome has this characteristic ECG pattern in the right precordial uh, leads. We know that that pattern can be spontaneous or drug-induced or perhaps even fever-induced. It's a very rare condition. It tends to affect men more commonly than women. And what we're really worried about is sudden cardiac death from polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. As I mentioned, usually we don't find a genetic cause for Brugada syndrome when we do sequencing. We do, um, we do observe that uh, most of the variation we find is in a gene called SCN5A, which is sort of an electrical and developmental workhorse gene for the heart. Uh, but when we apply these statistical principles, as I mentioned, and this is, by the way, a genome-wide association study Manhattan plot that I'm showing you in panel A, comprising a case control study of only 300 cases and 1,100 controls published in 2013. There's a bigger effort underway that, that hopefully you'll be seeing very soon. Um, there were two loci identified, three signals when we conditioned on the top signals here. Um, but this is compared to the the Manhattan plot I showed you before for AFib, which had 65,000 cases in it. So th these Manhattan plots are much more informative the more cases we have, it's a function of power. But nevertheless, um, when you zero in on these peaks in panel B here, you see that uh, there's a region upstream of SCN5A within SCN10A actually, uh, all of this makes sense for susceptibility to Brugada. Uh, but there was also a transcription factor, developmental transcription factor called HAY2 that was implicated as well in panel C. So new, again, new biology being discovered uh, relating to susceptibility of disease. And then if we create our polygenic risk score, uh, in this case, this polygenic risk score was overfit a little bit, but nevertheless, the principle holds using just three uh, SNPs, I think they used in this score, you can see that there is a gradient of susceptibility or likelihood of disease, in this case, an odds ratio. Uh, using this polygenic risk score for Brugada syndrome in a case control sample. So again, the statistical principles, the biology that I was talking about for AFib. We can do the same thing for long QT syndrome and uh, as a different disease this is a common form of uh, susceptibility to sudden cardiac death. Again, we're worried about polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, specifically torsade de Pont. Uh, and there are about three genes that account for the vast majority of long QT syndrome that we encounter in the clinic. KCNQ1, H2, loss of function variants in these potassium channel uh, genes, uh, as well as uh, gain of function mutations in SCN5A, which can lead to long QT syndrome. But again, about 20% of people are, quote, genotype negative. When we perform a genome-wide association study, in this case, 1,600 long QT patients, about 10,000 controls, we start to see uh, uh, common variation at established genetic susceptibility signals and monogenic uh, susceptibility genes for long QT syndrome. You see KCNQ1 there, you see KCNE1 on this plot, but we also see genetic susceptibility to the to, uh, loci that drive QT prolongation in the general population, NOS1AP, which is a nitric oxide synthase uh, gene uh, uh, dominating as well. And then when we apply a polygenic risk score for long QT uh, or for QT prolongation derived from the general population, so not from people who have long QT syndrome, we start to see, and I won't get into the details here, but we start to see that among long QT syndrome genotype negative cases, so that 20% of uh, the uh, sample of individuals who we encounter in the clinic who don't have a mutation in one of these genes, we start to see an enrichment for polygenic risk to QT prolongation derived from the general population among those with genotype negative long QT syndrome. Again, highlighting the potential role for common genetic variation in these monogenic diseases that we encounter. So what are the challenges that we're facing today in 2021 now? 
with genetic discovery for inherited arrhythmia syndromes. Well, there are a few large pedigrees. It's very hard to do the classic forms of mapping, this linkage mapping, because we don't have large multi-generation uh, pedigrees with many people affected. There are limited sample sizes for these rare inherited arrhythmia syndromes. It's very hard to do a genome-wide association study for Brigada syndrome, as you saw, even long QT is hard. Um, and there's phenotypic heterogeneity, and it may be hard to get the diagnosis right for these conditions. And I think we all recognize that. So how are we gonna address these challenges? Well, there's specialized recruitment and into phenotypes that I'll just highlight uh, very briefly in this talk. And so specialized recruitment <clears throat> refers to uh, really going after people who have particular disorders uh, in a really concerted fashion. And um, Dan Friedman helped me uh, recruit patients for genome-wide association studies that we're doing, uh, focusing on bradyarrhythmias and supraventricular tachycardias. That work is ongoing right now and in its final stages of uh, pulling together through a network that we've uh, uh, developed called AGENT, the Arrhythmia Genetics Network. We're also focused on rare genetic variation as well in rare conditions. So in that case, what we're trying to do is go directly to patients. We're trying to stand up web portals in which we can actually recruit patients directly rather than having to go to our friends at other medical centers and having them recruit the patients. So that's one potential way of recruiting patients and learning about new biology. And then into phenotypes. If we can find a good proxy for a phenotype or a disease, and increasingly that is the case with these large biobanks that are emerging, we can start to learn about disease. I'll show you briefly how that might work. So uh, for example, if we just take the ECG and we look at the standard conventional intervals that are reported on an ECG, and we do a genome-wide association study of those intervals, we create polygenic risk scores from those genome-wide association studies, we can test them for a host of different association with a host of different phenotypes. So in this case, we performed a genome-wide association study of about 300,000 individuals, uh, uh, just looking at the PR interval, pretty simple metric that's reported with a high degree of reliability on the ECG, created polygenic risk scores and tested them for association with, uh, with different diseases. And we see on the right-hand side of the screen, intuitively, uh, a polygenic risk score that predicts a longer PR interval is associated strongly with a higher risk of developing distal conduction disease and needing a pacemaker. Interestingly, that same polygenic risk score is associated with a lower risk of developing atrial fibrillation for reasons that we don't quite understand right now. And the story is much more complicated than that, but this is an example of how we might use uh, endophenotypes. Another example of how we might use endophenotypes uh, and rare variation, again, sticking with the ECG, looking at, in this case, uh, the QT interval and using sequence data from TopMed, the UK Biobank, and my code from Geisinger, uh, we can identify on the left-hand side are the Manhattan plots, but just all squished together for a variety of different uh, ECG intervals. On the right-hand side is a rare variant association test with different genes in the genome. And we see that we can start to nominate new genes, PAM, uh, MFG8. These are genes that have been identified but require further functional characterization linked to atrioventricular conduction. And when we, when we look at the uh, QT interval, we find exactly what we would expect to find, which is that rare variation in known genes in the general population, by the way, not patients with long QT syndrome, is associated with a markedly uh, increased uh, effect for uh, interval prolongation. So KCNQ1, KCNH2, the top two genes involved in long QT syndrome, we see with uh, pathogenic variation in these genes in the general population, a roughly 30 millisecond increase in the QT interval uh, among carriers. And of course, the carriers are relatively rare. You can see here a distribution of the QT interval among carriers and non-carriers. And if we draw a line in the sand at 460, 480, or 500 milliseconds, and you move to the right-hand side of the screen, the odds of having QT prolongation are gargantuan if you carry one of these variants, uh, upwards of 20-fold 20, 20 increased odds of having QT prolongation. But then again, you look at that bottom row, the probability of somebody with a QT interval of 500 or more milliseconds carrying one of these pathogenic variants is very, very low. It's only about 3% in the general population. So there's a lot we don't understand yet about 
what causes from a genetic standpoint susceptibility to prolongation of some of these intervals. Uh, but we can start to use these endophenotypes for disease, in this case, QT interval and the disease being sudden death to understand some of the pathways potentially. Uh, and, and we can apply these principles as well um, uh, to other disease entities. And so this might be of interest to the cardiomyopathy folks out there using cardiac MRIs from the UK Biobank. It's an incredible resource. It's a 500,000 person prospective cohort study in Biobank. If you're not familiar with it, <clears throat> you may want to uh, spend some time getting familiar with it because it's been an incredible resource. And we've observed that, and by the way, about 100,000 people will have ECGs, 100,000 people will have cardiac MRIs. Some of these will be repeated. There's all kinds of rich data from the UK Biobank. And when we used about 36,000 cardiac MRIs uh, and performed genome-wide association studies of some of the sort of basic metrics of cardiac uh, uh, morphology and function, we identified, uh, these are all Manhattan plots here, many genetic susceptibility signals for these, uh, for these conditions. When we created polygenic risk scores and tested them for association with disease, in this case, left ventricular and systolic volume index polygenic risk score, we saw a stratification of risk for dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and um, a stratification of future development uh, of, of disease here that might have some clinical impact in the future. So this is all uh, through the use of endophenotypes rather than studying the disease specifically. We didn't recruit patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. We didn't recruit patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Instead, we studied cardiac uh, uh, morphology and function, created polygenic risk scores, and tested them for association with future disease in a large biobank. So uh, vignette one conclusions, genetic discovery uh, has and will continue to yield critical insights into the biological mechanisms of arrhythmias. The goal is that new therapeutic insights will emerge from all of this. Common genetic variation and rare genetic variation contribute to the susceptibility of common and rare inherited arrhythmia syndromes and the role of genetics in the direct management and prevention of cardiovascular disease is less clear at the moment, but we're excited about where that's going. I'm going to shift gears and I'll, I'll tell you a brief vignette about some of the risk work we're doing, and then I'll give you a brief vignette on outcomes before I wrap up. Um, in terms of risk, again, I'll stick with atrial fibrillation here as an uh, exemplar disease. We, we are in our group feel that AF risk is a, uh, a calculating AF risk or assessing AF risk is a paradigm that may have relevance to population health management. And here is an example of an experiment that we did where we basically just applied several different risk scores for predicting atrial fibrillation risk or estimating AFib risk, some of which our group can, uh, helped come up with. Uh, we applied it in a large EHR data set comprising of over 4 million individuals from IBM. And you can see here the stratification in the right-hand table of risk uh, seems to be uh, of potential clinical relevance here. Um, and some scores perform better than others. And, and the left-hand plot is just the calibration of these scores. So some are pretty well calibrated, some are poorly calibrated to risk. You can see the predicted risk on the bottom, the observed risk on the, on the top. But the idea here is that using a few clinical risk factors, up to 10 or so, we can actually estimate one's probability of developing AFib in a five-year period of time. But it requires us to have information uh, that is measurable at the time of an encounter. We can do that with EHRs these days. Um, at the same time, the world is sort of evolving, and I bet a lot of you are wearing some kind of device that can track your activity right now and maybe even measure an EKG, and we'll talk a little more about that. Um, and, and what we're really interested in is figuring out whether there are modifiable biomarkers of atrial fibrillation risk. When we measure those things from the electronic health record, we're usually talking about height, weight, maybe that's modifiable age, probably not modifiable, and other risk factors that are generally not modifiable. But activity is potentially a modifiable risk factor. And we wanted to know whether we could use physical activity as a biomarker for estimating risk. Um, previous studies had relied primarily on self-report, which has a bunch of biases, as you can imagine, whereas wearable accelerometers provide objective data on ascertainment of uh, physical activity, that is. Um, so what do the guidelines say about activity? Well, the guidelines recommend at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week, or at least 75 of vigorous intensity. 
uh, per week. There are some extended guidelines <laughs> from the WHO that recommend a more aggressive exercise regimen over the course of a week. And we wanted to test whether these recommendations had any clinical merit or not. So we again turned to the UK Biobank in which about 100,000 people wore an accelerometer for about seven days. And we assessed whether guideline-based moderate to vigorous physical activity was associated with incident disease. We adjusted these models for age, sex, and clinical risk factors for AFib uh, and tested associations with five-year incidence of AFib and stroke. Um, you can see here the distribution of physical activity in this UK population. And this comports with what we've seen in other reports uh, about physical activity. This tends to be, the UK Biobank tends to be a healthier cohort. So these numbers probably represent even more physical activity than the average person does, perhaps even in the United States. But you can see here uh, the proportion of individuals who meet the standard recommendations for physical activity, roughly 40 to 50%, and then extended is roughly 20%, whether you're male or female. And we observed when we stratify by these recommendations, significant association uh, with incident atrial fibrillation. So the more physical activity you do uh, in accordance with these guidelines, the lower the risk of developing atrial fibrillation over time. Same goes for stroke. So a substantial uh, reduction in risk associated with, um, with physical activity. And of course, one of the concerns is that potentially these are confounded. Uh, associations. There could be reverse causation happening here. These are adjusted for clinical risk factors um, uh, that we know are associated with both AFib and stroke. And in additional experiments, we're thinking about using genetic instruments for physical activity uh, to try to uh, get at this causal mediation question. Is activity really causally related to a reduction in uh, risk of AFib and stroke? I think we, we suspect we know the answer, but we'll, we'll test that formally. Um, and one of the other things we've observed is that self-report data is an inaccurate surrogate for physical activity. So you can see the accelerometer-derived uh, physical activity on the x-axis and the self-reported physical activity from the same subjects on the y-axis. And there is a correlation, but it's not one-to-one -one here. So there is a bit of a mismatch between what you can measure from an objective uh, metric like an accelerometer as compared to self-reported uh, measures which are subject to recall bias, as we said. So for the risk section, and I won't get into all of the other work, but I wanna mention just and highlight that AF risk is calculable using clinical risk factors and modifiable risk factors for AF and stroke, such as physical activity can be objectively measured. Guideline recommended activity levels are associated with low risks of AFib and stroke and self-reported activity is an inaccurate surrogate for objective activity. And in this last bit, I'm just going to highlight uh, what we're doing to pragmatically potentially improve outcomes. Um, and I want to pivot a little bit and talk about AFib screening now. So I'm going to move away from genetics and uh, just highlight what we all know to be a problem, which is that stroke may be the first manifestation of AFib. You can see on the right hand side that roughly between one and 5% of people probably with a clinically diagnosed, uh, uh, with clinically diagnosed AFib between one and 5% probably present with a stroke as the first manifestation of atrial fibrillation. That'll change as we start to screen for AFib and pick up more subclinical forms of AFib. Um, and we, we know that screening may be effective, but there are really few randomized data and, and guidelines conflict. Um, we know that primary care clinics may be optimal sites for atrial fibrillation screening because they can identify individuals who might benefit from treatment, reach mass, reach mass populations, enable providers to affect change and enact change efficiently. There are a variety of settings in which screening can be conducted, um, but primary care clinics might be an optimal site. And so we performed a study uh, that we presented at the American Heart Association, and I'll just highlight some of the top line uh, results that we presented, um, called Vital AF, uh, sponsored by Bristol Myers Squibb and Pfizer, uh, to assess whether point of care rhythm assessment with a single EDCG will lead to an increase in newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. So we uh, performed a cluster randomized trial using primary care practices at the Massachusetts General Hospital Network. We screened individuals or offered screening to individuals at vital sign assessments. This was performed by clinic staff. You can see there uh, patients were offered to use an Alive core, which was affixed to an iPad. They could put their fingers on it at the time of a vital sign uh, assessment. 
we performed screening for 12 months. The results were integrated into the electronic health record. Cardiologists adjudicated all the tracings and all the data was ascertained using uh, the EHR. Um, we reported on the primary endpoint, uh, which is new atrial fibrillation at 12 months, requiring manual adjudication. There's ongoing work focusing on anticoagulation and adherence and stroke and bleeding. Um, here's the consort diagram. So there were 22 practices eligible, 16 practices were randomized, eight to intervention and eight to control. Um, overall, we had 91% of patients in the intervention arm ended up getting screened for atrial fibrillation, which is a very high uh, adherence to the intervention. And we observed a slightly increased probability of developing AFib, but it wasn't significantly different in the intervention versus the control arm. You can see here at one year, 1.7% individuals were identified uh, with new AFib in the intervention arm as compared to 1.6 in the, the control arm corresponding to an incidence rate of 2.59 as compared to 2.35. There was a suggestion, however, that the effectiveness of the intervention might vary with age, where, whereas there was not much of an effect at all among individuals aged 65 to 74. Uh, that likelihood of uh, the intervention detecting, resulting in a new diagnosis of AFib appeared to grow as people were older, indicating that perhaps screening might be effective uh, for the oldest individuals or those at the highest risk. You can see here the risk difference and a number needed to screen corresponding to about 53 individuals in that 85 and older subset. And there was also an increased likelihood of detecting atrial fibrillation at a primary care clinic encounter as compared to uh, another uh, encounter or another setting overall in the screening arm. So shifting things towards the primary, the diagnosis towards the primary care clinic. And so the brief takeaways uh, are that implementation of ECG-based rhythm assessments at primary care practices is definitely feasible, but screening all individuals, as is suggested in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, at least 65 years of age is not efficient for detecting undiagnosed AFib. Screening older individuals might be effective and screening may increase the likelihood of diagnosis at a primary care encounter. But what do we do now? There's so many strategies that have emerged and ways of, of screening for atrial fibrillation we can perform randomized trials of some, but not all of these strategies. And on the right-hand side, I've highlighted a couple of ongoing studies. One is GARD AF, in which uh, two-week patch monitors are being deployed to patients age 70 or older to screen for AFib and, and measure stroke as the endpoint uh, to see if screening is actually effective for reducing stroke. Uh, there's a SAFER study, which is a study using handheld ECGs in the UK um, repeatedly to screen for and potentially prevent strokes. We can't do this uh, for every potential strategy. There are too many, and these studies are expensive and hard to run. Uh, and increasingly, we're seeing that wearables are becoming prevalent and playing a bigger role. And I love this slide from my colleague, Dave McManus, that shows where we are. I don't know about you, but I have two, two devices on right now. Um, and we're increasingly seeing in the literature that mobile technology is playing a bigger and bigger, bigger role as time marches forward. Uh, and you can see here on the first column, ranging from pulse palpation, which was sort of the, the modality tested for AFib screening back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Now we're talking about wearable devices. So what can we do? We can simulate different strategies. And so here's an example of a project that's um, under review right now in which we simulated about 45 different interventions using discrete modalities, including pulse palpation, single lead ECGs, 12 lead ECGs, and patch monitors and continuous mo modalities, risk-worn PPG and one lead ECGs. We varied the frequency during which these modalities were applied and the duration, either a 12 month period of time or a full lifetime uh, of potential screening. And we observed if we look on the X-axis, the quality adjusted life years is the effectiveness of a given strategy that only about a third of the modeled strategies were actually effective. So a lot of the strategies that we simulated <clears throat> were actually not even effective at, uh, at, at uh, improving quality adjusted life years uh, per person. Most of the modalities that were effective involved wearables. So there are a lot of assumptions involved in this modeling, but the way we interpret this is that there's a likely uh, uh, important role of wearable technology as we move forward in, in this world of atrial fibrillation screening. And so I think what we're accustomed to now is this model where consumers go out, they buy a device, maybe they use a PPG uh, algorithm that detects an irregular pulse, then prompts them to 
put their hands on the device and measure a single EDCG, which runs another algorithm for detecting AFib. And then maybe we mail them a patch monitor to confirm that they really do indeed have AFib. That's the model we're familiar with right now. Um, but it may be that in the future, we as doctors are prescribing devices that are wearables to patients to do the exact same thing. It may not be that it's just in the consumer's hand. And we'll have to figure out whether that's a cost-effective strategy or not. And I'll put a plug in for a study that we're excited about that we're just wrapping up now, which is the Fitbit Heart Study. And you, you're probably familiar with the Apple Heart Study and the Huawei uh, study um, looking at a PPG algorithm for uh, detecting atrial fibrillation. Well, we, we just wrapped up enrollment for a large scale virtual uh, uh, remote clinical trial, a Fitbit Heart Study in which we're testing a specific algorithm uh, as well that has some unique properties. And we're hoping to report on this in the spring or summer. So in conclusion, AF screening is now widely feasible. The optimal methods and clinical effectiveness of screening are unclear. Uh, despite all the work that's been done, the risk of AFib may be a critical determinant of screening effectiveness, we think, and wearable technology is likely to have a major impact on the future approach to AF screening, though there are a lot of important questions that remain about the risk of stroke attributable to paroxysmal AFib, when to anticoagulate, et cetera. So with that, I'd like to finish and thank you for your time and attention today. It takes a village, and I've mentioned only a subset of the people that have been really critical for helping champion this work uh, along the way. Uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. That was... hey Dan, you're having a difficulty with your connection there. Talk. Hey, Dan, still having issues with your connection. How, um, well, you work on that. I'll uh, I'll get the question started. Okay. <laughs> hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. Somehow we're still hearing Dan Jacoby talk. <laughs> All right, we'll try and proceed. So thank you very much, Steve, for an absolutely terrific talk and apologies for the uh, Zoom uh, excitement here. Um, so several questions. Um, uh, so one that came up through the, the chat function actually from Dan, uh, he typed in earlier, said, at what point uh, and with what criteria do we begin to move away from describing disease as a clinical constellation, and describe instead by genetic ideology. Take over for the questions, Dan. Uh, so, Dan, <laughs> Dan Friedman, thank you. I heard your question. Um, yeah, so I think it's a great question. I mean, I think from a, a mechanistic standpoint, it's it's already time to think about diseases that way. And in the clinic, we've been doing that actually for some diseases for a while. You can think of long QT syndrome where we classify it as type one or type two or type three, et cetera, depending on the gene involved. But, but that doesn't even encompass the entire uh, spectrum of, of mechanisms. So even within long QT one, for example, which involves KCNQ1, there might be different biological mechanisms. There might be a gating defect. There might be a trafficking defect that results in disease. So I think that um, there are layers of complexity and my guess is that as clinicians, when we will, we will start to refer to diseases based on their genetic or mechanistic subtype when it matters for our clinical practice. So if there's a medication that really focuses on addressing a particular mechanism of disease, or if there's a prognostic implication of a particular subtype of disease, that's my guess is when we're, we're going to start to pay attention and, and refer to diseases by their, their mechanistic or genetic subtype. But biologically, it's already of interest. May, may I ask a question? Or? Uh, sure, Aria. Uh, very nice talk, uh, Stephen. This is Aria Mani. Um, I, I have questions regarding uh, your approach with the GVAS and what you're considering actually. Uh, so when you mentioned the GWAS, you sh it showed all these uh, kind of SNP signals, and then uh, 
immediately came to the genes as a, as a kind of a candidate. And I wonder if you actually, because a lot of these SNPs can not modify the gene that they are actually located on, but actually nearby, are you using EQTL mapping for that? And I think that is an important thing to do. Then related to that question is that you'd mentioned that finding families is difficult, that therefore the rare variance identification is kind of also complicated. But I wonder actually if you're using segregation, not in the large families, but actually using uh, siblings, cousins, first degree relatives, second degree relatives, to show that which of these systems are really causal. And that would be very helpful, even though if you don't have a large, and specifically for the soft threshold of SNPs, because a lot of, you know, UK Biobank has, you know, SNPs that are 10 minus seven, it's not meeting the threshold, but could be actually causal. Uh, and then again, again, related to that GWAS is that uh, you, you know, looking, we look at the statistic, statically, statically at these uh, SNPs, while, for example, things can be modifiable by hypertension, for example, mm -hmm. or can we actually look into this question and see if you modify the risk factors such as high blood pressure, salt intake, you name it. Uh, uh, whether this uh, kind of, uh, we can actually overcome the, the deleterious effect of the polygenic risk score. Or are you, are we looking into this question? Yeah. Uh, th those are great questions. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate those. So the, the um, I didn't really have time to get into the details, but you're completely right that the closest SNP doesn't necessarily, or the closest gene to the top SNP in a GWAS doesn't necessarily mean that it's the, uh, the causal gene at the locus or even the only gene at the locus that's functionally related. So we take a, you know, we involve a number of different techniques when we try to take our best guess at which is the causal gene at the locus, but nearest gene is one of the, one of the metrics there. We use EQTLs, we will perform um, transcription wide association studies. We might look at coding variation and see if there's any linkage with a, a missense variant that appears to be potentially pathogenic or, or deleterious or functional in another way. We might use other regulatory information, high CMAPs and things like that to try to implicate the, the um, most functional gene. I think your second question was about- um, Segregation. Yeah. Segregation, which I think is also a really interesting question. In the biobanks, the way we've been going about it is trying to employ statistical methods that can account for correlation. So we don't have to only look at independent uh, individuals, unrelated individuals in a family. So we can increase our power by accounting for a correlation genetically between relatives. And, and that's how we've gone about it. Because segregation still has been hard for us to, to use. And then the third question was about causal mediation, which I think is really interesting. And, and so increasingly people are using a technique called Mendelian randomization, which is what we're thinking about too, to try to get at whether, um, you know, create these genetic instruments for, for a disease that may be modifiable or risk factor that may be modifiable and see if, if uh, that is related indeed causally um, to a disease. But there are a lot of assumptions there as well epidemiologically. Nevertheless, it seems like a pretty powerful technique. We're excited about it. Yeah, Rachel. Hi, Steve. Thanks. That was a fabulous talk. And I'm so sorry you're not here in person because it, it's got me thinking about so many things. Uh, that I'd love to talk to you about. But to just uh, focus on, on one particular point that you made about it, your last point about the widespread screening and the continuous monitoring. It seems to me that um, one of the sticking points of this is the interface between the massive amounts of data generated by the wearables and the patients wearing them and the physician who's then gonna have to sort through all this noise to find the signal. Have, what systems do you think can ultimately make this work? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Rachel. I mean, I, I sort of think about it, it the way I, it, it makes me think about what happens when we order a, a CAT scan, maybe before a pulmonary vein isolation procedure or pulmonary vein mapping, and then there's an incidental finding in the lungs or something, and the radiologist gets back to us and says, recommend repeat CAT scan in three months or six months, depending on um, degree of suspicion or index of suspicion for, for you know, for malignancy. And, and I wonder if as a community, we need to be thinking about standards like that, where we can sort of return information, both to patients and physicians to say, hey, you know, we found this much atrial fibrillation, or we found this high rate uh, event, we don't know what it means, but we recommend some type of approach to follow up options A, B, and C seemed 
like they're reasonable options and maybe endorsed by professional societies. And I, I wonder if we need to think about things that way to help. And in the in the interim, we're obviously going to need to do studies to understand what the relations are between burden of AFib and stroke risk. And we're going to have to figure out whether if we anticoagulate for four hours of AFib, it has an impact. Um, but in the meantime, while we're waiting for those studies to report out, which will probably take years, I, I do wonder whether we need to take a more uh, proactive approach in terms of guidance, uh, because the devices are here already and we're all struggling with the data. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, one last final question, uh, Joe Akar, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, thank you, Steve. That was a really, really nice talk. And I just have a, um, a question regarding some of the data that you, um, that you showed re with the relationship between exercise and AFib. And it's a two point question. My, my question is, um, there's now a lot of um, both clinical and experimental data showing that the relationship between exercise and AFib is actually a bit of a U-curve mm -hmm. where um, we are with enough, um, um, with increasing levels of intensity of exercise, there's actually an increase in the arrhythmia, an increase in AFib. And um, so my question, I have a twofold question. A is, and, and clearly I think that there's a genetic component to that because clearly not every single triathlete is gonna develop AFib, but, but, but some do and some don't. And if you look at them as a group, they have a higher risk of AFib. So my question is A, a what do you think about the, the genetics of this in, in terms of predisposition uh, to AFib with increasing exercise? And secondly, um, um, when you looked at it with your data, it seemed to show more of a, of a linear relationship as opposed to a U-curve. And I was curious as how you would explain that. Uh, great questions. Thanks again for these. These are really insightful questions, all of them, and I appreciate them. The, I think the, um, the U-shaped curve is definitely something we're interested in. And we do see you know, um, what looks like a tapering of that linear effect at the upper tail of physical activity. And I didn't show all the analyses we did, but we do start to see a relationship that we think suggests that maybe, you know, we're just at the uh, lower limits of our ability and resolution in the UK biobank to detect that association that you're talking about with increased activity and um, uh, AFib risk. And it may just be that the population doesn't represent enough of that kind of extreme athlete phenotype um, to be able to pick up that signal. So I don't think we can rule it out. Um, and then the other question about the genetic interaction, I think is a really interesting one. We haven't looked at that, but it, it would be interesting to potentially look at the genetic interaction or an interaction between genetic susceptibility to AFib and physical activity. Um, that's not something we've looked at, but I think it's a great idea. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Thanks everyone for joining us for yet another remote cardiovascular medicine grand rounds. We'll see everyone next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.